So I would welcome you uh, for the first panel, which is uh, dedicated to the new threats. My name is Daniel Koštoval. I'm senior fellow in uh, Prague Center of Transatlantic Relations. And I have the honor to introduce our uh, distinguished uh, speakers. Uh, it is General Karol Řehka, Chief of General Staff of the Czech Army. Uh, it is Dan Rosendorf, the CEO and Chairman of the Board of uh, ICZ Czech Company. And it is Tomáš Pojar, National Security Advisor. Before I give the floor to Karel Řehka, I would like very shortly say a few words about this panel. Uh, the title is New Threats. Uh, it means, uh, or it is meant that there are traditional threats like uh, military aggression as we see it, for example, very close to Czech Republic in the Ukraine. Uh, but there are new threats uh, stemming from the uh, revolution in technologies, uh, in communication, in IT, in, uh, in the, in basically in the digital world. And when in those um, technologies used uh, very willingly and very intensively to target, uh, for example, infrastructure or the functioning of some state, it can really disrupt uh, uh, life of the society. So we should discuss about uh, what we plan to do about those threats and uh, also how we feel actually today those threats, in, because there is already some impact uh, in terms of materialization of those threats, at least partially. A few days ago in Czech Republic, uh, there was actually a slowdown of the internet banking because of the uh, already primitive technology was used to actually attack the, uh, the websites and the internet banking of, of basically all banks in Czech Republic. So there is definitely of some materialization as well already. So thank you for listening to the introduction. And now quickly we will jump to the start and I give the floor to General Karol Řehka, please. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, I wanna thank the organizers for doing this and inviting me. It's, it's a pleasure and honor to be here. Uh, so, uh, something about the new th threats and uh, secure communication. Uh, obviously, for, for Czech military, just like any other NATO military today, uh, this is the big uh, transformation period. Uh, there's a lot of stuff going on. Obviously, the biggest impact on the change of the security environment is, is the war in Ukraine. However, it didn't start it didn't start with the war in, uh, in Ukraine. It, it was it was process which was going on uh, for some time. The war accelerated everything because it was a wake up call for most of the Western societies. So we uh, started to to, to take it more seriously. Uh, what is happening? The, the whole alliance, the whole NATO, is reacting. We have this new uh, deterrence and defense concept of the alliance territory. And now we are filling it with this, with this as, as they call it, family of plans, which is basically a bunch of plans, including the regional plans. And the biggest difference is that we want to have the, the very detailed, executable plans for both deterrence and defense phase. Uh, we are also strengthening the eastern flank, and we are also building the new force model, which is basically... The, the new package of military forces and capabilities to fill those plans and make, to make sure that they are executable. So this is what's going on in NATO. You could see it, uh, the, the plans got a green light and, and the same as the kind of a new defense investment pledge got the green light in the last NATO summit. And the Czech Republic, because our defense is based on the membership in NATO and we will always be defending ourselves as part of the alliance, we are basically mirroring what is going on in NATO. So we are re reacting as well. We get a new uh, national security strategy. The defense strategy is in the final stage of uh, approval process and the military is working hard on, and it's basically ready. It's, it's going through the approvals and coordinations we build in our uh, capability development concept for our military. The biggest change in everything for the military, for, for, from my point of view, is that uh, there is a new security paradigm and it says to me as a military that we need to be preparing 
for the large scale high intensity conflict armed conflict with technologically advanced enemy which possess the nuclear weapons basically what it means in current setting is we should be preparing for the war with russia and that's that's completely different uh, what we had before before uh, we were the, the tasking for the military was not to be preparing for the large scale conflict because the probability is so low, we'll have enough warning time, and so on, so on, so on. So this is completely new framework, and it brings completely new set of problems uh, before military. Uh, so this is just, just to frame uh, the, the whole situation. Uh, obviously, we are reacting, and uh, what we need to do now, we are reviewing all our defense plans, on the national level to be in line with those alliance plans. We are also trying and pushing very hard to speed up the modernization process because the military was heavily, heavily under-resourced for many years. So we need to modernize pretty much every war fighting function. Everything military does on the battlefield needs to be modernized today. Uh, it's not happening, like it's not starting. Some of that is already ongoing. Uh, but we need to speed up this process. And, but we also, as we build the capabilities, we cannot just fill the, the holes and gaps, but we also need to look at the future. Because as you know, what's the definition of capability management is that you, you need to balance what you need now and what you're going to need in future. So we have to look at that as well. That's why we are also working on this uh, future warfighting vision for our military to be in line again with this whole transformation in NATO. What's going on in NATO? NATO reacted in 21. They approved this uh, new warfighting uh, or NATO warfighting uh, capstone concept, which is basically the vision how the security and, and operational environment will look like in future and how we foresee how we're going to fight basically in, in future and what we need to do. And it's all about this multi-domain uh, operations. Uh, we are doing the same on the national level and, uh, and we're looking at that and that comes down to technologies. I think the biggest, the biggest char characteristics or to sim simplify it all is that basically we will, we, will need to be, we, we will need to be able to work in all domains at the same time in a synchronized manner and we will need to be able to collect and process the vast amounts of data and making sure that we deliver right information at the right time to the right user and, and he can very quickly act on this information. Uh, what, is, what is also happening is that uh, if you look at the technologies and those emerging disruptive technologies as we all discussed, the quantum, AI, big data analysis, robotics, you know, all that stuff, uh, there is certain window of opportunity and we need to for the next decade, we need to all collectively, Alliance, but also us as a Czech military, we need to work very hard on making sure that we can take the opportunities from those technologies and we, could, we, and, and we can field it into our way of doing business, into our warfighting concepts. Uh, so it's not only getting the technology, but use it right and put it rightly in, in, uh, in, our, in our concepts. If we don't do that properly, then we will lose the edge and we'll be in a disadvantage later on. Uh, that applies to the whole NATO, but that also applies to Czech Republic. I would say especially Czech Republic, because considering our size, our resources, our human resources especially, we cannot use the approach of the attrition. We cannot go for attritional warfare. Because, because of the size, because of the demographics, because every, all of that. So the right strategy for us, and the whole NATO is trying to do that, is, is to, to maintain this technological edge. And that's, that's what we need to do. And that's important for, uh, for the new, new technologies. Obviously, to be able to do that, uh, we need to digitalize <laughs> first. Because if we don't digitalize properly, and that's, again, that's a big push in the whole NATO 
to digitalize the forces and we need to do it as well in the Czech Republic because otherwise you cannot work on processing this large amounts of data. And uh, robotization is the big, big thing. Autonomous systems, we can see it in Ukraine already. And, uh, and obviously all domains including, including cyber and space. That doesn't mean that we need to possess all the capabilities for space, countries like Czech Republic, but we need to be able to understand it and to realize what impacts it has on us. And, and it has uh, it has done repercussions even, even in our military at the, at the tactical level. Uh, if I look at the topic, it says new threats and secure communication. Obviously, if you don't have secure communication, that's it basically. You cannot do this. Also, to be able to do this in the future war fighting, it all runs in the electromagnetic spectrum. So we need to also work and we need to be, if nothing else, we need to be able to maintain the freedom of maneuver in the electromagnetic spectrum. Because if we don't do that, we don't have communications. If we don't have communications, we cannot transfer data that, that, that we cannot basically fight this multi-domain uh, concept. Uh, so, not only we need to fill the old gaps, which we are working on right now, so we buy new infantry fighting vehicles, we're looking at tanks, there's a huge discussion about fifth generation aircraft. We're looking at uh, guns, air defense, ground-based air defense, uh, 3D radars, and I could name different stuff which is already either under contract or, or we're working on it to get it. So, so a lot of that is filling the old gaps, but, but we need to make sure that whatever we bring as a new stuff, hopefully it has kind of open infrastructure and, and we are able in future to interconnect it and network it all. The fifth generation aircraft, there's a huge discussions in media right now. Uh, I'm sure you noticed, <laughs> everyone, uh, because it, it's, it's a big, uh, it's a big uh, procurement. It's historically uh, the, the, the most costly uh, procurement for military, but that's exactly about this. The fifth generation aircraft, it's the step into future. And not only I think it's the right way, uh, not only I think it's also an uh, effective solution for future and long-term solution, but it's a, it will be a huge transformation driver for the whole military. So it's not about air force, it's not about aircraft, it's not about air policing, it's about everything, about the whole military. And, uh, and it, will, it will speed up the processes which we would have to do anyway. And that's the digitalization, transfer of data, and all the rest. That's why it's not only about aircraft and pilots, it's about data centers, it's about communications, it's about having enough IT specialists, and so on and so on. And uh, maybe last one, and I will stop there. Uh, we also have to, even at military, we have to look at this uh, mil military civilian uh, interrelationships because if we look, for example, in cyber domain, you cannot work as a military if the civilian cyber infrastructure is not secure enough. It's impossible because it's so interconnected, the, the interdependencies are so huge, which we in military sometimes don't quite recognize. But then if you go deeply, go through the war games, go through the plans, then you realize how much we are dependent on civilian infrastructure. And that's why also the new strategy, defense strategy, articulates very clearly that the defense of the country is not only about military, but it's the whole of society and whole of government effort. And uh, I would probably end there, and maybe, sorry, maybe one more point. And it's talking about these uh, infrastructures and communications, I think we, one thing we should learn from this Ukrainian war is the danger of the strategic dependencies. We saw it, the biggest problem of the whole thing of supporting Ukraine was the dependencies in energy on Russia. But we also have to look at the dependencies in uh, technology. Uh, so especially uh, supply chains, security, things like, you know, how much are we dependent on certain countries in telecommunications, for example, and other areas. And uh, it's not that I'm politically correct. Yes, I'm talking about China, uh, uh, but not only China. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, General. Uh, 
Actually, uh, you at the end touched on a very important thing. Uh, actually, there was an article, I think two days ago, that China actually changed the policy and the uh, export of important uh, metals like germanium actually practically stopped, at least temporarily. Uh, but it already takes time, uh, for some time already, so it's like two months already with no export, which is, and the germanium is important for production of the chips. So it's exactly that problem. Uh, and, but I would like also to say that uh, you mentioned what everything you will need and what you plan to have, but somebody has to invent it, somebody has to produce it, somebody has to provide it to you. And that's why we have on this panel also a representative of the, of the private sector, of the, of the, of the private industry, uh, the Czech company, which actually can offer uh, secu um, uh, solutions for secure communication, for example. So next speaker is Dan Rosendorf, CEO of ICZ Company, and the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Um, dear ladies and ge gentlemen, I would like to first uh, thank um, the organizers for inviting me. It's a, it's a great honor to be in such a distinguished panel. Uh, I'm really happy to be here. Um, I, I have to say that, uh, that um, General Rechka has already said a lot of the things I wanted to say, so that's, it's good to hear that other people are thinking it too. No, that's, uh, that's definitely fine. Um, I won't talk more about the, the change of, uh, of um, the, the battleground, the change of uh, the whole security uh, situation in, in uh, Europe and, and really worldwide. Uh, I do want to talk a little about some of the things that were mentioned, whether it's uh, AI, where I definitely see uh, a huge amount of new opportunities in terms of, unfortunately, both sort of attack and defense, so both for us and against us in, in both schemes, because we will always be uh, on both sides. Uh, there has been a huge amount of work done in um, in AI in terms of uh, machine learning, in terms of uh, neural networks and these kinds of things which are really important for a lot of the, uh, the applications later on. Uh, there is, right now I think the uh, sort of the focus is more on, on the language models and, and, and these kinds of things with chat GPT uh, coming out and, and open AI and all these things. From my point of view, those are more the, the sort of soft targets. Uh, it's really important to work with those in terms of what's happening, uh, how they are affecting the civilians, how, they are, how the civilians are interacting with them, and what's then happening with uh, information uh, processing, with the kind of information that people are getting and are being fed in some cases, I'd say. So there is a lot of that, and there's lots of, lots of very tricky ethics issues uh, around AI. There has been for a long time a, a committee in the European Union about uh, ethical AI and what kind of applications can and can't be, uh, uh, can't be actually used, uh, can AI be used for. And of course there's an exception for the military, but it's always a little tricky in terms of how you get the private sector to really develop these things if, if the exceptions are specifically for the military. So there's, uh, there's a, I think, still work to be done there, definitely. Uh, quantum has been mentioned. Uh, in my opinion, that's, at this point, slightly less of an issue still. It's, it's definitely an interesting technology. A lot of things has been done in there. Uh, there is a huge amount of, uh, I think, nervousness regarding working quantum computers and the reliance of the civilian, but not just the civilian, even the military, uh, on, uh, uh, on security, on ciphers which are uh, vulnerable to, uh, to quantum computers if they, if they, become, vi if them, if they become viable at, at that size and scale and, and, and time frames. Uh, luckily, a lot of that can be solved with uh, post-quantum algorithms that are not actually quantum-based in the sense that you don't need a quantum computer. 
there isn't really all that much uh, quantum cryptography as such. It's, it's often talked about in that direction, but it's really quantum key distribution. That's a very important part, and it's, it's definitely worthwhile. Uh, there are still kinks to be ironed out, uh, but if we are able to, to really transfer, um, um, to do key distribution over satellites through quantum queue distribution, that would be a huge boon uh, for the military and, and even for the civilians in the long term. Uh, but there are solutions which are being uh, implemented at this time uh, for the issues uh, around uh, public key cryptography, uh, which can solve the whole issue with, with completely standard computers. You don't have to actually uh, do anything special. You don't have to have a quantum computer. You don't even have to have a quantum gateway. Uh, nothing like that. There is lots of interesting stuff being done around um, uh, quantum uh, randomness generation and randomness generation in general. So I think that's something to, to sort of be mindful of. Uh, but one of the things, and, and it was one of the things that, uh, uh, that the general said at the end, and that I think is really important, and we've seen it not just now with Russia, but already during COVID, and that's supply chains. Uh, and specifically from my point of view, uh, supply chains for chips and for IT infrastructure in general. A lot of these supply chains go to the east, specifically to China. Uh, we don't have a very good uh, alternative uh, we, because we actually do, uh, do work in, in, in hardware. We have a, a lot of experience with this and, and we do have some alternatives in the US, which is great. Uh, but there is a huge amount of work to be done there and to, to really understand what this means. There was a very interesting case uh, in 2018 that surfaced while Amazon was actually doing a, a due diligence. They were acquiring a, a little company and they were doing some due diligence. And as part of that due diligence, uh, they did some very thorough security testing of, uh, uh, of servers. And what they actually found as part of that security testing was that on the motherboard of those servers, which were completely standard servers that were delivered from China in that specific instance, uh, there was a fairly tiny chip that wasn't supposed to be there. Uh, really hard to figure that out, really hard to find that. It's not something you just look at and, and you can see. And that chip allowed uh, external attackers to gain control of executive functions on the, on the server. And this is, this is very problematic. Uh, it's something that you can work around through the way you build your information systems, through the way you, do, uh, you use the hardware, but it's something that uh, needs to be thought about. Uh, and this leads me to sort of the, the, the last point I, I'd like to make, which is a little bit about national and, and supranational sovereignty in terms of what we can and what we should be doing uh, on our own, what we should have locally, what we should be able to do locally, and what we should be able to do with our, with our NATO allies, EU allies, or even just externally. And I think there is a lot of work uh, to be done there in terms of uh, interactions of the private sector with the national authorities, uh, in terms of uh, how we focus the strategy, what we do actually keep locally. I think uh, communications and, and a lot of these things can to some extent be done locally, and they should be, and the, the national authorities should keep some sovereignty there, not just because they want to be sovereign, but also to bring uh, new ideas and new approaches to the allies. Uh, and that is something that we, we, also, uh, we also work on quite a bit. So, so these are sort of the, the things I wanted to talk about. And, and for me, from all the, the new threats, 
the supplier dependence, the supplier chains are really one of the, one of the most, uh, most problematic parts of, of the whole situation. They are very hard to manage effectively. A lot has been done in the last years to start on that, but it's, it's just not easy because uh, due to the globalization, due to the way the world works today, it's really hard uh, to deal with this, a lot of the uh, a lot of the last 10, 20, 30 years, there has been outsourcing done. We have kept only parts of the things locally because it's the most efficient. There is no doubt about that. It's much uh, much more cost effective, but it is something that we definitely have to deal with. Thank you very much. Uh, before turning to the last speaker, uh, I just realized uh, that I learned uh, recently that uh, the, uh, when speaking about the access to, 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 to resources, to materials, uh, that actually systematic geological research in Europe, including Czech Republic, but generally in Europe, was done in the 70s and beginning of 80s. From that time, nothing basically, and it was done with the technologies known at that time. So I think one of the solutions uh, to the problem with germanium only, almost from China, is we have to look at whether we don't have it with current technologies, in, whether we don't have it in Europe actually. Okay, this takes me to last speaker, which is National Security Advisor Tomasz Poyar. Um, I would like to ask him whether he could also, in his intervention, also a little bit speak about uh, what it means that the government adopted uh, just recently a new Czech national security strategy, what we can expect in terms of uh, acting of the government, and not only this government, but future governments, uh, in based on following what what is being requested, what is being asked by this strategy. So, Tomáš, the floor is yours. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, I have three points which I wanted to mention, but uh, let's go to the security strategy and defense strategy, which is going to be adopted hopefully soon, uh, which should not be in the conflict uh, with the security strategy, on the contrary. And then uh, other relevant documents uh, which will try to make sure that the strategy is not only on the paper, but it's also relevant for the actual decision-making and the deeds of the state. Uh, so, uh, and let's see, we are sometimes very good in strategies and writing strategies and, uh, and action plans, and then uh, uh, nothing is done. Uh, so, so I hope that this time it will be different, because at the end, if you look into the security strategy, and if you soon will see the uh, defense uh, strategy, uh, there is nothing unexpected and nothing completely new. Okay, it's, it's in some ways it uh, more clearly and more realistically and more openly describes the world where we are uh, we, we are living in, uh, and uh, f compared to the situation and how the situation was uh, uh, looked at uh, those uh, ten years ago, uh, a long time ago, when the previous strategies were put together. So the world has shifted, the the uh, security environment has. Uh, uh, changed, uh, so, and uh, so I think we are more open in talking uh, about the threats and into, let's say, blaming and shaming those who we think that they are responsible for uh, our insecurity and those who are uh, to be challenges uh, uh, to our system in the uh, in the future. Uh, so, but uh, at the end, uh, uh, that's not a re revolutionary strategy, uh, so, uh, and you will not expect, uh, you should not expect from this government or from Czechs by nature any revolutionary ideas. Uh, and uh, the most important part for me is uh, how uh, that what is written down in the strategy, how that will be implemented and how it will turn to be relevant in the everyday life. Uh, uh, and let's see. I hope we will do a better job than in the past, but. Uh, uh, but it is not uh, only up to the government, it is up to uh, the whole society and up to uh, the whole um, the infrastructure and ecosystem, including, by the way, up to, uh, up to the business. 
as uh, I want to, I, I did have prepared three points. Um, uh, one, I basically, or partly at least, but almost fully exhausted in uh, the opening uh, session uh, or opening part, uh, and this was this was the this was the stress of the importance of work of the government and government structures and the state structures together with uh, with business uh, and the real need of that. Uh, so there again, if looking back uh, we were in the past sometimes uh, hijacked by business or the state structures uh, uh, to put it like this uh, and then the state was uh, so much uh, uh, turned into itself that it was omitting cooperation with the business. Okay, I'm a little bit exaggerating, but I think that you know, or at least those Czechs here know what, what I'm talking about. So there were missteps by the business, uh, first, and of course missteps by the state. Um, uh, and we can uh, be discussing if it's, uh, what is first, if chicken or, or egg. Uh, but uh, I just hope that we are over this phase, and I just hope hope that there will be relevant and good and solid and long-term cooperation of the state and business, uh, understanding uh, that there are core interests and mutual interests which are at the end the same. And this is the freedom and security and prosperity of the whole society, because without one of these, then the system is going to collapse and uh, business will be in a miserable situation as well as the state will be in a miserable situation. So we are basically doomed for this cooperation. And everyone has to understand what are the lines and what are the red lines and, uh, and who represents whom. But without that cooperation, again, we will be stagnating and our security, uh, including the communication or security of the communication will not be guaranteed and uh, and will not be uh, will not be functioning or functioning properly uh, my point number two is uh, 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 to look at the, and we have to really look at it, uh, and by the way, again, jointly as state uh, and the army and the business, uh, if, uh, if look at the Ukrainian, or let me put it, Ukrainian and Russian battlefield uh, so, uh, as a great laboratory. Uh, and uh, I mean Ukrainian and Russian battlefield, not that I would be counting Crimea into Russia, so I still consider it Ukraine, but you can see how the battlefield is expanding to not only to Belgorod, but to Moscow and Kursk and Rostov and other places, and I guess that this will be the trend. Okay, There is the, the line between the border or the official state border, as recognized at least by most of the world, uh, is been, has been blurred, and you will see activities of Ukrainians much more and more, um, and more often in Russia. Russia, and of course, the main battle will be and uh, raging in uh, Ukraine uh, itself. And uh, those lessons are on one hand that yes, we have again seen that uh, this type of war is impossible without using tank and artillery units, so the traditional parts of the military structures which we sometimes thought that they are obsolete and we will not need them anymore. Uh, and not only in Czech Republic, but in any parts of the world. By the way, two years ago, EU mainstream was dreaming about taxonomy for tanks, okay, that we will have tanks on the electric engines. Uh, for, so it's uh, for, forgotten for the time being, but it will come back. Uh, so, so let's be vigilant. Uh, so, uh, if, uh, uh, but it's not only about artillery and tanks, it's also about UAVs and the use of UAVs and the use of UAVs from the first day of the war until now and it has changed dramatically. You can see that on the uh, story of the Bayraktar in the first months very much uh, great weapon for Ukrainians and then because of the Russian innovation, a weapon which was not that successful in the later stages uh, and the, uh, because the Russians have been innovating as well as the Ukrainians have been innovating on the battlefield. And uh, every battle, every war is about a lot of innovation and it's about thinking for the next round uh, or thinking about how to stop the next round, but it is about also technological advances. Uh, it's about uh, UAVs and electronic warfare and the enormous role what the electronic warfare plays and how both sides have been able to adapt in there, even including their own new technologies which they have started to, uh, to develop. It's about uh, incredible Ukrainian ability 
to put together the Soviet and post-Soviet systems and the various different platforms of Western donations, and by the way, something what the Ukrainians have bought in the West, and how to put it together and how to effectively fight with that. And you can always argue if the effectiveness could not be better. It can always be better, but it has been incredible how Ukrainians have used those platforms together and how they have started to use them together to everyone surprise uh, and it goes so to it goes also to the communication look at the story of Starlink and Elon Musk uh, and what it means then to be dependent on a private company in a better in, in, in a good uh, way but also in what what kind of threats there are if uh, there is this much dependency and on a particular person as, uh, if the decision making is done as uh, we can read about it in the newspapers uh, so 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 really the, the the laboratory of this war we should all watch we should all learn from, because our competitors and our enemies are learning as well, uh, and we should not just stay uh, aside. And uh, uh, my point number three is that, uh, f uh, and as Czechs also, we are usually not good at it, uh, f uh, or I wish we would be better, uh, but uh, uh, to take the crisis as an opportunity, and we really have to take the Russian invasion of Ukraine as an opportunity. And I can see there are a lot of opportunities, uh, partly linked to what I was already describing, uh, uh, but it brings a lot of opportunities. Uh, 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 opportunity number one, Karel has mentioned, modernization of our army. Uh, imagine where we would be without Putin uh, invading Ukraine. Uh, it's uh, it's uh, the acceleration of the modernization of our army is finally here. We got the first push in 2014 with the uh, invasion of Crimea and starting war in the eastern Ukraine. There, our modernization has started slowly to pick up again. Uh, 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 a lot has been done, and we can always argue if it could be more or less, uh, but also thanks to Daniel, who was for many years responsible of that uh, f um, and inside the Ministry of Defense. But then this great boost by Putin now, uh, and you can see completely different thinking and completely different opportunities. Of course, we have wasted 20 years of non-spending, and we have huge gaps to fill. But at the same time, we can also think about the technologies of today and the future, uh, and we don't need to think about technologies of 10 years ago, which we have wasted to look at uh, those 10 or 15 years ago. Uh, opportunity number two is uh, really it goes into not only into the army or hardcore military itself, but it goes into the all security sector and including to the critical infrastructure and including the, uh, the communication infrastructure. And it is also another boost uh, and a wake up call and boost to really look at it more seriously and to do something with that and to really start seriously working on it, uh, uh, on it now. And if we do it and if we do use this opportunity, Opportunity, we can be better off in the future. If we don't waste, uh, if we waste this opportunity, then uh, we will be uh, worse than what where we are now, because the others will be running faster, and the others will be again not only investing, uh, uh, but also uh, also uh, innovating in this uh, in this field. Uh, the great opportunity number three is, and it goes directly then to the business, is the opportunity for defense and security security business and security for the broader sense. It will open a great new competition, uh, but uh, because of our proximity to the war, then I think Czech companies can profit from it more than others and can be more uh, competitive than the others because they do see the opportunities much more than how it is seen from Spain or Portugal yes, uh, or from, from lazy Germany. Yes, um, uh, an opportunity number four is uh, that it's an, it's an opportunity for building partnerships. Uh, from the day one of the war, and we now have day 575 or something like that, every day, every single day, from and through Czech Republic, organized by us, together, state and business, at least one piece of tank, artillery, MLRS, infantry fighting vehicle, helicopter, was delivered to Ukraine. Every day, at least one piece of heavy equipment. 
if you want to get more statistics, is what is 1.3 pieces per day. Okay, so if I say every day, even if we didn't say anything now from on, then I can be saying that every day, even for an, another half a year, and it will be still valid. Every day, 12,500 rounds of mid-caliber and large-caliber ammunition has been sent. Every day. Uh, and I'm not talking about ammunition for pistols and rifles. I'm talking mid- and large-caliber. Uh, why I'm saying that? Not that I'm proud, I'm proud of it, is, uh, but it has brought a lot of opportunities for partnerships. We would not be able to do it just with Ukrainians. We would not be able to do it with other allies where we are working on the daily business that this system like works and functions, and it's not our system, it's not us only and exclusively working on it because we would not be able to do it. Let me mention four. Three of them I already mentioned was in the last, but let me mention four countries. It would not be possible without Netherlands and Denmark, and it would not be possible without US and UK. And there are many other countries who have been involved, uh, so, but those four are very key and, cru uh, key and crucial. And we have two other countries on the list which, uh, how we want to expand it. Uh, so, uh, I want to tell them first not to you, so, so, so next time I will mention it. Uh, but we want to expand this uh, circle to use it as an opportunity for cooperation, for cooperation on the platform of the NATO or of the allies, but then at the end the every deep and sincere and deep-rooted cooperation is bilateral. It's not multilateral. 27 or 30, it's nice, or 31, it's nice. But there you share a lot of information, but not, uh, not, not, uh, not all information. Between two, in four eyes, you can share more, so you can do more. And it doesn't go only for the partnership with NATO. We would not be able to run this system and to do it without partnering with countries who are not members of EU and NATO. And there I cannot name them, because usually they do not want to be named, uh, and it's fine with us as far as they cooperate and it works. And some of them, you would be surprised who they are, uh, and the Russians may be surprised as well. Uh, so this, these were my four points of using the war or the Russian invasion as an opportunity, and I think we should take them as an opportunity, and based on that, to put it into the, uh, into the, uh, f to put it into the uh, substance of those security and defense and other strategies for really building the systems and build, building better functioning and more resilient system uh, in every sector we can think of. Thank you. Thank you, Tomasz. Um, thank you for your, in, uh, for your information and intervention. Uh, it's actually do something, not just discuss. I think this is exactly needed now. Uh, I would like to ask Karel Řehka, because he was a first speaker, so he couldn't somehow react to other speakers, whether he has some reactions to other uh, panelists, what, what, what was said. Yeah, okay, I'll try something. <laughs> yeah, well, f first here it was mentioned the uh, supply chain security, how key it is. It is key, uh, definitely, and to be honest, the Czech state doesn't have legal tools currently how to work with the supply chain security. So quite often what may happen that you as a state institution have to procure solutions which you know are not good for security reasons, but that's where the system is pushing you. Currently, there's, there's a work going on on such a le legislation. And I'm, the reason I'm bringing it up, because I noticed that uh, the NUKIP director was coming in. <laughs> Ciao. Uh, and I know it started when I was in NUKIP. It's still going on. And, and that's a huge push against it through different channels, uh, logically, because any security measures are raising costs, usually. So there's a, there's a resistance from the business, but many times I think this is also externally influenced, just using different platforms, either through certain politicians, certain businesses, certain uh, professional associations or whatever. 
So, so we have this kind of uh, schizophrenia. So we, everyone recognizes it's important, but when you want to do something with it, you know, everyone is trying to object it. And what they do currently right now is they try to, through smart argu arguments, uh, no one says, oh, no, 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 we oppose that, that this is not important. No, no, no. But they do, they basically try to delay the process so, for so long that it will not be done for political realities in the end and it will extend the period for, for years. So I'm just bringing this up because it is important, I agree, it's quite key. And also, it's, it's not about how much you want to restrict things because there are realities, yes, everyone knows that you will never have 100% uh, security, it's impossible, especially in cyberspace. Uh, we also recognize that it's about risk management, you have to manage the risks, you have to take some risks, you have to balance the costs and the security measures, that's okay. But the state needs to have a tool, the legal tool. How are you going to handle the tool? That's another question. But you need to have some tool. Currently, we don't have it, so we cannot protect against those threats, which everyone recognizes are very, very important and will be even more in future. So I just want to bring it up so it's known, because many times you hear a lot of disinformation about it, but this is reality. The reality is Czech state doesn't have a defense against these problems, and there's multiple efforts to, to prevent uh, the states to have it, basically. So, so that's, that's one thing. And uh, second thing, as, as Tomáš mentioned, this, uh, Tomáš mentioned this, uh, these opportunities, yeah, that's what we exactly do. Uh, we look it at the laboratory. Obviously, every conflict, every war is, is, uh, is shaped by the situation. So not everything is replicable. Uh, but it, it is very, very uh, good opportunity to watch what's going on. The things I was talking about uh, with this new war fighting, with this multi-domain operations, with the sharing of data and everything, everything can be seen in Ukraine right now. So sometimes you get a feeling that it's a first world war-like conflict with the trenches and tanks and guns, but behind that is a lot of technology data sharing, operational clouds, and uh, procedural things, and uh, robotics, UAVs, as, as Tomáš mentioned. So it, it's a way to do it. And actually, even that cooperation works. So there are instances where, for example, developers from our businesses, from our companies, are meeting Ukrainians, discussing uh, certain technologies with the military specialists by their side, basically. And we try to learn together. So it is actually happening. Thank you, Tomas. You wanted quickly. Yeah, yeah. I, I uh, want to react or to support the part what uh, Carol said. It's, uh, I also see the resistance from the business for some changes, and it's the resistance of the business which doesn't want the changes. What is astonishing for me that I don't see push from the other part of business for which it would be beneficial those changes. Mm -hmm. So we see only blocking the change, and we don't see push and the opportunity seen from the others to push for such change. It's shocking, okay? <laughs> that the business doesn't function as a business. It's shocking for me. And to put it, uh, not going into the Czech experience, but uh, look, Donald Trump, American president, named and shamed two Chinese companies, Huawei and ZTE. And Huawei and ZTE was fighting against this naming and shaming. I understand it. I understand fully why they were fighting against it. And all those who have been working with them were fighting together. What I really don't understand why Samsung and Nokia and Ericsson and why the other business was not saying, yes, buy European. Buy European, of course, we are here for it. <laughs> I really don't understand. So for me, sometimes the Western business has lost its sense of business and sense of finding the opportunities. And I would like to see not only the resistance for the changes, which in many cases I understand, and this resistance is legitimate and it's completely fine, but I would also like to see the other part of business 
which would be fighting for those changes because they are good for security, but it's also good for their business. Mm. But this part of business is usually silent, okay? Mm. <laughs> so I don't understand it. So let's turn to okay. business now. Yeah, yeah, I, I, that's my intention actually, because you mentioned uh, during your intervention uh, the importance of the dialogue between the state and the private uh, sector. Uh, that's one thing. Uh, second thing, you spoke about uh, opportunities. I, I see also uh, one big opportunity to really not only invest, but implement uh, what's at hand uh, newly, the technologies, not, not to wait. So there's another opportunity. And I wanted to ask Dan Rosendorf, actually from his point of view, you mentioned artificial intelligence and quantum technology. So actually, uh, from your point of view, uh, Czech national security agencies, uh, MOD or some other Ministry of Interior, Police or, or NUKIP, are they actually having a dialogue with you and companies like, like yours on artificial intelligence and what could be done and how quickly could be done those, uh, those things? Are there anything going actually right now? Okay, thank you. I'll actually respond first to, to Mr. Poyar here, just because it's a very, I think, interesting question. And I can't answer for all of business. I can partially for, uh, answer for, for us. And there is a huge problem with the, with the optics that you end up under if you do actually go for these changes. Right now, because these are all essentially anti, um, uh, sort of, this is against the way that tendering is done now, right? It, if we are saying, yes, we think we should be working on maybe excluding some companies from some tenders because we believe that for security reasons this is an important thing. If if you try and actually start pushing that, you end up risking getting accused of being protectionist, of, of trying to, uh, to subvert the, the correct tender process, of uh, sort of trying to gain an unfair advantage, and of trying to mark up prices, because then they won't be able to buy it from the, the uh, you know, generally less costly alternatives, and finally now ICZ is going to be able to sell the, the high-end things that they want to sell or whatever. And this is really problematic in, in, the, current, um, in the current atmosphere, I think. Uh, we see a, a lot of problems around tenders not being um, uh, transparent enough of, or of there actually being uh, police interventions uh, due to incorrect tendering or, or, or possible bribery or, or whatnot. And these are always things that uh, as, as a company we are acutely aware of and we are trying to make sure that this is not something that if we at all can avoid it lands on our doorstep. Right, because uh, yeah, this this is really uh, tricky for us. So yes, I'm I'm the first person who would be for saying we need to evaluate companies based on on security threat levels and and, and based on and and this is the the unfortunate thing. In some ways, it's you said political correctness, and that's exactly what you are what what we are sort of fighting against here. Because it's really hard to say. Yeah, we think maybe we don't want to really buy from China all that much because it might be a security threat. And that's really not something that's very well received in, in, in government in some places because they're saying, well, that's, you know, that's incorrect, that's politically incorrect, you're lumping everyone together and so on. So, so this, is, this is tricky. So that's one thing. Uh, to, to answer the, the second questions, uh, we have been talking with... Uh, both MOD and we've, we've been uh, working with the, the National Security Agency for, for a long time. Uh, we definitely uh, consult with them on, on a lot of things. Uh, honestly, I would like the, uh, 
the cooperation to strengthen to to be larger in some cases. Uh, we see it around uh, in in the other um, uh, in the other countries around us, in Germany, in, in France, where a lot of these uh, national security agencies are are much more involved uh, in in a lot of the things and have on the other hand, probably completely different budgets. So that's something that uh, is to be, I think, assessed and as part of the push for 2% of GDP uh, for the military, it's a question whether some of those things shouldn't go into other very sensitive, secure places. Well, uh, General Zerka wants to react. I just would say before him that uh, there is actually already some effort on the side of general staff. There is kind of a cell, uh, or uh, how to put it, of what could be called as innovation hub. So there is actually some trajectory. So please tell us more. Yeah, well, we we try to do uh, a little bit. Um, we start in. So um, I have my like kind of very informal advisory body as well, uh, which I do sometimes. So so we sit with uh, different people, mostly from academia, from different both technical and non-technical uh, things. Usually those are people which we know or have a reference for or saw their work or they pretty much uh, somehow we interested in uh, having the dialogue with them. Uh, we, so we do little things like discussing what subjects are worth of uh, exploring, uh, what could be used for students to explore, things like that. But we also have in a more serious discussions. Uh, we are looking at this AI, and uh, just just signed recently a memorandum uh, with uh, with Czech Technical University on the subject. Uh, but there are also different ad hoc works on the, on certain. Uh, specific development uh, projects like in EW area, for example. There are also things, as I mentioned, where we actually, the, the companies communicate with uh, with this uh, Ukrainian customers, for example, in military, and uh, and they take us as, as, as our specialists who, who do the R&D together with them, or vice versa, if we have interesting information, we share it. So, so I'm not saying there's a, a, like a huge thing, but, but yes, things are going on. You also, I would warn, you, you need some expectation management. You know, this is not going to happen like quickly. Yep. Plus, you know, we are trying to process maybe, maybe next year, maybe twice as much as we were doing in some years uh, on, on procurements, for example. Uh, and even at that, that time, it was a problem. And it's the same amount of people who is doing that. So uh, plus, we need to do much more. We, yeah. uh, we so 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 the the system is kind of overloaded. Everyone wants to catch up right now. We wanna, we, you know, there are certain things which we didn't pay attention to for last 20 years, and now we wanna have it all in one year. It's not gonna happen. So, but but I think the tra tra trajectory is right. But also, I think there's. I think the Czech companies could use more uh, projects like uh, the international R&D projects like uh, Diana or, or uh, European Defense Agency projects. Yeah. And it's, uh, it's definitely worth it. So, so if you can, uh, consider signing in and, uh, and exploring yeah. some of those projects. Thank you. Thank you. Diana is definitely an opportunity for Czech Republic as well because there should be some innovation centers and actually polygons for testing technologies uh, in whatever direction. Uh, in Czech Republic, the responsibility got a Czech invest company. So we'll see how it goes. Uh, we should not miss that opportunity, actually, to have uh, good things in Czech Republic. I think uh, we have still some time, so I would like to turn to the audience. Uh, I see, yes, please, I see a hand, please. Please introduce yourself and... Thank you. Uh, my name is Andrzej Olszanski. I'm a security policy analyst and counsel. Uh, I would like to follow on uh, Mr. Poyar's remark that uh, he does not understand why the business uh, that competes with Chinese uh, conducts in a certain way that it doesn't want to compete. Well, <laughs> what the business wants is a stable environment, continuity of operations and foreseeable and computable profit margins. They don't care about geostrategy, geopolitics, they don't care about multilateralism on state security. And the point is, we don't see eye to eye. There is a gap in communication and sort of proverbial wall. There is 
a wrong way we communicate this, our concerns about China, our concerns about uh, security in communication, security in supply chains. They don't understand our point of view. What we need to do is to talk to them in their own language. We need to tell them that, okay, we have seen what happens with Russia, we have seen what happens in Ukraine, we have seen how it impacted business and how much did it cost, how imposed costs in conflict work. If we do that and we say to them, okay, you are looking at a computable profit margins, but when this happens, for example, a crisis in Taiwan, in South China Sea escalates, there will be imposed costs on you, and those costs can put you out of business. So you need to prepare, you need to, as General Shechka very well said, you need to do your due diligence, you need to do your risk mitigation, and perhaps come with some outcome that will comply with our geopolitical point of view on these matters. So there's a gap in communication, and business don't want to speak our security oriented language. This is the main problem why these companies don't want to hear us. So just comment or question as well? The question is if you would, uh, for example, add something to that, that uh, how we can enhance this communication, how we can talk to business better and how we can enhance understanding between the government and the NGOs and the private sector. Okay, okay. So Tomasz, please. Uh, well, I understand what you are saying. There is more, not magic formula for that. Uh, just simply, there has to be more empathy on the side of the state as well as more empathy on the side of the business to talk to each other, under, trying to understand each other, trying to understand each other's position because at the end it's to the mutual benefit. Uh, and it is, uh, it's, it's not going to happen and it's not happening overnight. Uh, so it is a process and sometimes it is a slow process and long process, but I think it has started. Uh, f uh, by the way, you are not living in a vacuum, it has started uh, in other countries and Mircea was uh, naming something, what are the plans in NATO, it goes from the same roots and from the same needs. Uh, so uh, f uh, f what I'm calling for is more to, to not to be closed in uh, our own bubbles and to have more empathy and, uh, and, and talking with each other, as, uh, as a universal rule, by the way. Uh, f uh, 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 let me mention this, I understand fully, and the state has to understand uh, that there has to be a level playing field for everyone. But this is it. As, uh, this is it, this is something which cannot be broken. And of course you can, depending on the business, then you can speak about the territory of Czech Republic or the rules of the EU. There has to be same rules for everyone for the certain market that someone is not disqualified. Or someone has no rules which are going to put uh, that kind of entity out of the market. But if there is the same field, then as business, listen, the customers will pay. It will be more expensive. Yes, security is expensive. Uh, so, so it will be more expensive, but without insurance and without security, it will be way more expensive if something happens. Uh, so it is about the willingness of to pay some premium or some security, some insurance, and then it's going to be paid by customers. But it has to be paid, it has to be the same for every company there. Uh, if, uh, I discussed five years ago with late Mr. Kellner, if I see the PPF mark, the issue of Huawei. He was not arguing for Huawei. He was arguing, saying, we want, this, we want the same rules for O2, O2 set in, or O2, as for T-Mobile and Vodafone. If Huawei is disqualified for everyone, we are fine. And this is exactly the logic which I understand, which everyone should understand. So he was not arguing for disqualifying Huawei. He was not arguing for keeping Huawei. He was saying just don't ban Huawei for one Czech entity running O2, and don't allow T-Mobile to profit on cheaper Huawei. So if it's based on security, and if it's based for some technological competition, on some arguments, let's have it the same for everyone. And then, healthy business will be fine. 
unhealthy business will find for, fight for some privileges. Yes, I agree, I understand. If you are not compatible, then uh, uh, you cannot make it. But the competition and level playing field has to be there for everyone, and this is the magic for everything, and then you can base security and security premium and security limits, uh, and it's, it's fine. And there, the business cannot complain. Okay, the, the, those the disqualified business, Huawei can complain, okay? Or if not, uh, but not the overall business like, like here. So this, this, is, this is important, and this is important to understand. Thank you. Yeah, please. Yeah, just, just very quickly, there are positive cases where, for example, the companies would come to us and say, hey, you know, this regulation from EU would make us start buying something, and because there's no regulation, we'll have to go for cheapest one, and it's going to be probably China, and we think it's not right because it's danger. In future, could you help us with some kind of warning regulation, whatever? So, so sometimes it happens. No one wants companies to, to do geopolitics, that's fine. Uh, and when I was talking about this legislation and this, uh, this, uh, this different obstructions, we don't want companies to say, don't buy China, no. It's about, let's design the mechanism for the state that in some cases, for certain infrastructure, we will have a decision-making mechanism that we can limit, you know, dangerous suppliers. Yeah. And even that, most of the companies sabotage. So, it's not about, we don't want them to be them to say China or Russia or whatever. No, it's fine, the state will do that. But it's about just creating the mechanism. And, and with going back to this uh, China, Huawei and whatever, you know, sometimes it's a plain stupidity because yes, you want to have the same, uh, same starting position, same market, really? Go to China and provide some, exactly. sell them some IT into their critical infrastructure. I mean, you cannot compete with them because you don't have the same conditions as they have. And, and you want to accept it as a business? Fine. Yeah, exactly. And I would like to add uh, that uh, even in European Union, there is Article 346. Then when it comes to the sovereignty and security, it's a right of the uh, member state to have its own decision and not to run a tender if the member states thinks for security reasons he wants to do this or that. So that's important. So uh, I see two more, two more. So please, please, and then gentlemen here. My name is Jan, okay. My name is Jan Philip from ICZ. Uh, I'm account manager for the army. So I would like to add a practical point to, to what you are discussing now. Uh, it's not as easy as restrictions to China product. It's about the fair competition, as it was said. But fair competition is defined by the conditions of the tender. And it has two parts, technical specification and uh, uh, evaluation criteria. And if the evaluation criteria are 100% price, then the only uh, tool you have is the technical specification. So um, from, from my daily life, I can say that the way how to solve the issue you are discussing about is to work more closely and fairly about the uh, technical specifications. To make the technical specifications filling the point which is really in the need of the customer and uh, which is also not, not eliminating but giving the uh, well-defined concrete technical criteria to choose the solution which will fit the needs. That's, that, that's, that's my, my point. Thank okay. you. Thank you. Please, gentlemen over there, do we have a mic for him? Yeah. Thank you. My name is Martin Schiefer from the European Commission, uh, DG Home Counterterrorism Unit. Um, we have already been looking into this topic and started with a few reflections. I would just add to what the previous speaker said in reply to the remarks on how to find commercially viable solution to the security challenge, the cost, etc. And one of the key factors is definitely, in our view, current state of reflections that we need to look more closely into procurement laws. We have to make the selection criteria broader than just the most cost-efficient um, 
offer that is uh, providing the technical solution in order to be able also legally speaking to cater in for the higher costs to provide premium security solutions. And I think this is a regulatory task, partly at the national level, maybe even more at the EU level, which I think we will have to address sooner or later. It's more a comment than a question, but I just wanted to add very strongly to what previous speakers said. This for us is, is indispensable now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I would just add that actually in EU we have uh, uh, those opportunities to act according to needs for the military material, but not if Ministry of Foreign Affairs or some other agency, which is actually part of the security system in the country, wants to act properly. So thanks very much for your remark. This is definitely needed to, to change the regulatory framework to be more up to date to security needs. So uh, I saw there was one more or not? No, no. So, we are, I will see, yeah, exactly, we should start a coffee break right now. So, <laughs> and I don't see any questions. So, it's perfect timing. Thank you very much, speakers, for coming. Uh, it was, I think, very nice and very um, interesting discussion and productive, I think, as well. We have new topics to dwell on, to, to follow them. Thank you for questions and the coffee break starts now.